So I've started with this picture here because this is pretty much how I have presented myself online. I'm essentially a shadow. I'm not on Facebook. I am on Twitter, but just barely. In my four-year career on Twitter, I've tweeted a grand total of 26 times. And uh, I think 24 of those were actually retweets of what other people said. So I think that technically means I've only ever really said two things myself. So it's fair to say that I like my privacy. So you might be wondering, what on earth are you doing up here now? And believe me, I'm asking myself that question now as well. <laughs> but the answer is this. Yes, I am worried about my privacy. But I'm actually a bit more worried about a response to the big data revolution from people like me that might start to get in the way of some of the very real benefits that big data could deliver. Let me give you a bit of context. I spent 10 years in the UK diplomatic service. For part of that time, I worked for Prime Minister Tony Blair on global issues like migration, terrorism, and the G8 global poverty agenda. So things that affect all of us collectively in a really profound way. Then I decided I wanted to see things a bit differently. So I went into the private sector, where I now work with technology companies. Some of them are tiny startups, and some of them are huge. But the common thread is that they're all addressing big global challenges, whether in health, energy, food, or finance. So again, things that affect all of us collectively in a really profound way. So I've spent quite a lot of my career thinking about these big global issues and how we can address them, including through technology and data. And I see some amazing work being done. Here's an example. The global population is projected to reach 9.2 billion by 2050. Global food production will have to increase by 70%, 70% if we're going to be able to feed the world. To meet that huge challenge, we're going to have to do things smarter. Precision agriculture technologies can maximize food production, minimize environmental impact, and reduce cost. These techniques use satellites and sensors in the fields to gather real-time data on weather, soil and air quality, and crop maturity, so they can help farmers to make the best decisions with regard to planting, fertilizing, and harvesting their crops. And new farm equipment like this can plant the optimal amount of seed for a given part of a field. And in future, we'll be able to customize application of fertilizer just for those small parts of a field that actually need it. Just imagine that. No more blanket applications of fertilizer where it might not be needed. And here's another example. Researchers from the Santa Fe Institute have used large sets of mobile phone data to understand the dynamics of Kenya's huge urban slums. This is Kibera slum, home to around a fifth of Nairobi's population. Looking at how people's mobile phones connect to different cell towers as they move around, researchers could identify the places where people went to spend their days, presumably for work. And they noticed how much change there was in overnight locations. Identifying these patterns over time offers the prospect of predicting where the next slums will develop, how they will grow, and how surrounding urban areas will be affected. And on a very practical level, they can help local authorities with very limited resources to find the right place to put a new latrine or a clean water pipe. I think that is amazing. And that's just two examples of how data and sensors are making a difference for the greater good. But I'd like to tell you now about a story that happened to me about a year ago and that pretty much sums up for me the experience 
and the reaction I'm seeing from more and more of us on an individual level, and that could start to threaten some of this amazing work. So I was talking to a really good friend of mine last year about some proposals in the UK for sharing anonymous medical data across the National Health Service. Now, this plan aimed, among other things, to highlight diseases and conditions that are in real need of greater investment to tackle. Now, don't get me wrong, there are very good reasons to be cautious about your personal data being shared beyond your own doctor. But she wasn't just cautious, she was terrified. She hated the idea that faceless people might be able to look at her most personal information. It made her feel scared and out of control. And she was furious that anyone could even have suggested this idea. Now, even for someone who likes my privacy, I was surprised by how emotional and how strong her reaction had been. But she wasn't alone. I've seen the same with my mum, many of my friends, and judging by the comments on newspaper websites, many of the public too. Maybe some of you also recognise some of that feeling. What's the result of that? Well, the UK has now put that medical data sharing plan on ice because of these widely expressed privacy concerns. But that will also set back efforts to prioritise investment. And there's plenty of other evidence showing ambivalence towards technology and data. In recent PwC research, 82% of respondents said they were concerned that wearable technology, like heart rate trackers or pedometers, would invade their privacy. And in research carried out by Comres in 2013, 79% globally said they were concerned about their privacy online. I think that there are two narratives that are getting louder and louder in the conversation about big data. The first is that these huge streams of data are being used by sinister people in government who just want to monitor us. And the second is that all this data is really only about massive businesses learning more about me so they can sell me more stuff. Now, I'm not going to debate the evidence for these views, though, depending on where you live in the world, there is some truth in both of them. So, it's right that we're cautious. Protecting privacy is critical. You'd have to be very, very naive not to appreciate the potential for misuse of data when in the wrong hands. So, you should ask questions of those who want to use your data. And you should urge better forms of regulation, especially on the retention and use of your data. But just like with my friend last year, what I'm seeing more and more is that people's response to their unease is not just to question, it's to retreat completely. They shut down. Maybe some of you have even had a bit of that feeling. And when people shut down, it starts to threaten some of the amazing things that can be done with big data. I'd like us to think about an interesting parallel here in immunisation policy. Success relies on enough individuals being vaccinated to provide herd immunity. This protects the minority who have not been vaccinated or for whom the vaccine fails. So I took my baby son to be vaccinated recently, and if his vaccine doesn't work, I'm relying on everyone else getting the shot to keep the disease suppressed. So there's a social value to individual actions, but you need to have a critical mass who say yes. A survey by CVS Pharmacy in the US in 2013 showed that 59% of us consider it a social responsibility to get the flu shot every year to keep our community healthy and minimise the spread of the influenza virus. And another study in the same year by the RAND Corporation showed 
that people are more likely to get vaccinated if they know that their peers have been. What if we could think that way about a concept of social value or collective value from our data? Where enough of us are prepared to share our data with protections because there's a benefit to society as much as to us. Large data sets can provide researchers with the opportunity to tackle medical and environmental challenges if there is a critical mass who say yes. Let me give you a couple of examples. Researchers from St Michael's Hospital in Toronto have used data on Ebola virus cases, which they've coupled with crowdsourced road data, satellite imagery and rainfall data to identify the communities in West Africa that are the most isolated from Ebola treatment facilities. So, and then they'll become even more difficult to access during the rainy season. So these are the communities that will find it the most difficult to completely eradicate Ebola. And knowing where they are means that authorities can try to send them more help. Look at the detail of this picture here. But a big part of this jigsaw comes from people sharing information on their local roads and movements. And this cannot happen if too many of us shut down. And let's think about another of the biggest challenges to modern medicine, detecting and treating cancer. At the moment, only 12% of Europeans in the higher risk age group for colorectal cancer are currently being screened, just 12%. One of the big reasons for that is that they don't want to take a slightly unpleasant test, so they avoid it. And anyway, these tests can often pick up people who are already showing symptoms. So the reality is that cases can often be picked up too late for treatment to be fully effective. But there might be a data solution to this problem. If you have the right blood count data and enough of it, you can start to spot patterns that identify individuals at a higher risk of harboring cancer. And then those individuals can be referred on for further tests. They've done tests of this already in Israel, and the early results are really encouraging. 15% of cancer cases will be caught up to a year earlier than current screening tools allow. That is remarkable. And just imagine if it had been your mum or your dad who'd had that kind of help. But you need to have a lot of people's blood data to be able to spot those patterns. And that can't happen if too many of us shut down. <coughs> Why am I saying this? Why do I feel a little less scared of big data than some others? Well, I've worked at the heart of a government, and I now work with some of the technologists who are driving this data revolution. And in my experience, the vast majority of them are driven by a very real desire to have a positive impact, and not by something sinister. There is more benign intent than you might think, and a less sensationalist voice that needs to be heard. So how can we build the confidence that we need for people to feel comfortable sharing their data? Well, part of the answer is in stronger protections. But if we want people to feel comfortable, people like my terrified friend, I think we need people to feel more in control of their own data. We need to put them in the driving seat. The Genetic Alliance in the US has pioneered an incredible system where people can give very detailed permissions to allow medical researchers access to their data. If they want, they can give permission before each use and only once they have learned more about the objectives of the research. And this is not as much hard work from the researcher's point of view as it might sound because they can quickly and easily give that further information at the touch of a button. I find this really exciting because it respects the fact that people have different views on privacy and it enables 
even those like my friend who are the most concerned to say yes in those circumstances where they feel comfortable. So my ask of you today is this. As someone who sat on both sides of the fence, in government and among tech entrepreneurs, be alert to privacy issues. Urge your lawmakers to enact better regulations, particularly on the retention and use of data by both government and business. But please, don't let that caution turn to paralysis. When you read those scary stories, which are there every day when we open the paper, just stop for a moment and think about the other side too. Think about the amazing potential of big data to help all of us live better together. Ask yourself, what would you lose and what could society gain? Thank you. Thank you.